In this video, I'm going to take you through the unfortunate demise of Spencer Percival. This was a unique event, the only assassination of a British Prime Minister in history. Before I recount the events of the assassination, it's worth giving a brief sketch of this now fairly unknown Prime Minister. Spencer Percival was born in 1792 and was Prime Minister between 1809 and his murder in 1812. Percival was the son of an Irish Earl, however as the seventh son, the rules of primogeniture were not kind to him and he was forced to work for a living. He worked initially as a barrister until the age of 33, at which point he entered politics by becoming the MP for Northampton. What were his political beliefs? He was a Conservative, and was fiercely loyal to William Pitt, supporting his war against Napoleon. Percival was also a devout Protestant, who opposed Catholic emancipation. However, in other areas he was rather more liberal. For example, he was a committed supporter of the abolition of slavery, and held a somewhat sympathetic stance towards the trade unions, which is unusual for the time. Percival was an extremely buttoned-down guy who disliked gambling, drunkenness and so forth, anything fun. However, like all boring people, he often kept some rather interesting secrets. He actually eloped with his wife, whose father disapproved of the marriage, and lived for a time above a carpet shop. Percival served in government, first as Attorney General and then Chancellor of the Exchequer, before rising to the position of Prime Minister in 1809. Percival's leadership, however, was fraught with difficulty from the very beginning. His government was extremely tenuous, and he also had to deal with the madness of King George III, as well as a deep recession for which he was widely blamed. For context, this recession was caused by the continent-wide trade embargo which Napoleon had imposed upon Great Britain and her colonies, known as the Continental System, and the naval blockade of France that was established by Britain in retaliation. One side effect of this commercial warfare was that it acted as a contributing factor to the outbreak of the War of 1812 between Great Britain and the United States shortly after Percival's death, which only made the economic situation worse. Before I recount the events of the assassination itself, I think it's worth giving a brief sketch of Percival's assassin, as well as mentioning his political grievances. John Bellingham was born in 1770 in the former county of Huntingdonshire. Bellingham's father tragically ended up in an asylum and the fact that mental illness was clearly in the family has been picked up on for reasons that will become clear. Sometime prior to the assassination, Bellingham had worked as a bookkeeper for a company trading with Russia, and he spent some time living in Archangel, in northern European Russia. However, while he was there, he became embroiled in some rather complex legal difficulties, arising from debts of a business associate that it was claimed Bellingham was also liable for. This resulted in a brief spell in prison. When he was released, however, he remained in Russia and took the rather rash decision to attempt to sue the Russian authorities, and so perhaps inevitably found his way back in Russian prison. On this occasion, Bellingham was only released after a direct appeal to Tsar Alexander. On his return to London, Bellingham pursued a campaign for compensation from the British state, which he believed he was entitled to. However, he found that he was refused by the Foreign Office, the Prime Minister himself, Spencer Percival, the Prince Regent, the Privy Council, the Treasury, essentially all the important offices of state. Bellingham would eventually contact every single standing MP, yet his campaign was still unsuccessful. Anyone who's ever had the misfortune of having to deal with state bureaucracy would probably have some sympathy for Bellingham, <laughs> at least at this point. On the 18th of April 1812, Bellingham met with a Treasury official and declared that he would take justice into his own hands if his grievance was not redressed. It seems that the official did not take the threat particularly seriously, however, and Bellingham was rather dismissively told that he should basically do whatever he felt was right. Unfortunately, Bellingham followed through. He purchased two 50 caliber pistols from a high street gunsmith. For context, I should point out that there were no meaningful gun controls in Britain at this point. The right to bear arms had been enshrined in the British Constitution for centuries, perhaps most notably in the 1689 Bill of Rights. This idea, of course, ultimately found its way over to the American colonies, where it's still a potent idea. Whereas on this side of the Atlantic, we've slowly moved away from the original ideology. Bellingham then proceeded to visit a tailor in order to have an inside pocket added to his coat in which he could conceal a firearm. I think we're ready now to discuss the events of the assassination. John Bellingham spent the morning of the 18th of May to 1812 dealing with correspondence, followed by a meeting with his wife's business partner, his afternoon was occupied by a visit to a museum with his landlady and her son. He did not arrive at the Palace of Westminster until around 5 o'clock in the afternoon. 
Bellingham had made numerous recent visits, in which he often conversed with waiting journalists, making inquiries about the identities of various members entering and leaving the chamber of the House of Commons. Somewhat counterintuitively, therefore, his appearance was not considered particularly suspicious at the time. At 5.15, the Prime Minister, having been called to a session of Parliament, entered the House of Commons lobby on his way into the chamber to participate in a major debate. His assassin had been waiting patiently, seated on a nearby bench by the fireplace. Bellingham rose and stepped forward, drew a concealed pistol and shot the Prime Minister at almost point-blank range. The astute cry of, I am murdered, was the response of the Prime Minister as he fell to the floor. The assassin Bellingham then sat back down and waited to be captured and gave himself up without a fight rather than fleeing, declaring something to the effect that justice had been done. Percival was dragged away by the Honourable Member for Norwich, who was incidentally the grandfather of Florence Nightingale. However, the Prime Minister had died by the time a surgeon arrived. Percival left behind a widow and twelve children. There was panic amongst the establishment that this was part of, or could potentially incite a revolution amongst the population, though with hindsight we know this was not the case. Troops were deployed on the streets. Bellingham was dragged before a hastily assembled court of MPs, where he stated that he had warned the government and been told to do as he pleased. He stated, I have obeyed them, I have done my worst and I rejoice in the deed. The authorities were undecided on whether he was of sound mind. During his formal trial in the Old Bailey, despite pleading not guilty, he claimed that he would have preferred to have shot the British ambassador to Russia, Leveson Gower, rather than that truly amiable and highly lamented individual, Mr Percival. Bellingham, somewhat ominously also declared, however, Recollect, gentlemen, what was my situation? Recollect that my family was ruined and myself destroyed. Merely because it was Mr Percival's pleasure that justice should not be granted, sheltering himself behind the imagined security of his station, and trampling upon law and right in the belief that no retribution could reach him. I demand only my right and not a favour. I demand what is the birthright and privilege of every Englishman. Gentlemen, when a minister sets himself above the laws, as Mr Percival did, he does it at his own personal risk. If this were not so, the mere will of the minister would become the law, and what would then become of your liberties? I trust that this serious lesson will operate as a warning to all future ministers, and that they will henceforth do the thing that is right. For if the upper ranks of society are permitted to act wrong with impunity, the inferior ramifications will soon become wholly corrupted. Gentlemen, my life is in your hands. I rely confidently on your justice. He was sentenced to hang and executed on the 11th of May. While there is no obvious link between the assassination and the later gradual tightening of gun controls in Britain, the event is perhaps remarkable in terms of its uniqueness. Assassination by firearm have been feared since the days of Queen Elizabeth I, yet political assassinations have been incredibly rare compared to many other countries, despite the wide availability of guns at the time. Percival is one of our forgotten Prime Ministers, and the following administration moved away from his policies. Ironically, a descendant of the assassin, Henry Bellingham, has enjoyed a successful political career and is the incumbent Conservative MP for North West Norfolk. I hope you enjoyed this video on a little known event in British history. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed it.